Good evening, everyone. Uh, a warm welcome to you for another event in our Black History Year series. Um, my name is Julia Hendricks. I'm an academic engagement librarian and member of uh, the Black History Year steering group here at the University of Westminster. Um, I'm hosting this event on behalf of the steering group and I'm very pleased to be here with Joy Francis this evening. Um, Please. Joy is a co-founder and executive director of Words of Colour, um, the Immersive Change Agency, um, which develops alternative pathways and opportunities for writers, creators, uh, entrepreneurs and communities of colour to thrive. She's also the co-founder of Digital Women and the Black Love Project, which we're going to be discussing today. Uh, she's a former journalist and has collaborated with the Media Diversity Institute to launch the UK's first diversity and media MA uh, here at the University of Westminster. She was also appointed as the media liaison lead for the Hillsborough Inquest uh, on behalf of the civil rights uh, law firm Bernberg Pierce. Um, Joy is a long-standing activist for racial equality and cultural inclusion in literature, publishing and the media. Um, in 2022, she was a judge for the British Book Awards and was elected to the Royal Society of Literature as an honorary fellow. So before we begin, um, welcome um, Joy, we want to welcome you this evening. Thank you so much. Great to be here. And I'm actually great, glad to hear my voice, not out of vanity, but I've had no voice for most of last week because of this, <laughs> this hybrid COVID flu, sorry, flu cold virus that's going around. So yeah, I'm just glad to be here really. Oh, great. We're, we're, we're happy that you were um, able to recover Cover, cover quickly enough to join us this evening. So just before, um, just to note, um, there will be ample time at the end for uh, a Q&A session and you're invited to send your questions, thoughts and responses in the chat. And uh, this event is being recorded and will be available on the BHY website. Um, so to just give some context to our conversation today, we've just got a short clip to introduce um, the Black Love Project. I think there were some technical issues there, so I'm not sure if we got to hear that. Can you hear me, Joy? Yes, I can hear you. That's, oh, okay. Yeah, I, I can hear you. Yeah, yeah. I also didn't hear it. So, okay. Um, yeah. So, unfortunately, I mean, for those who uh, who are in attendance at the moment, um, I'll see whether or not we can make that available separately. I'll, I'll check with you later on. Um, but yeah. Okay. All right then. So, I mean, basically the video was just a short uh, overview to the kind of scope of what was covered um, in the Black Love Project. Um, it mentioned uh, that it was founded in um, 2013 with a focus group that you used to kick it off. And then the actual survey ran um, from uh, 2014 in February and you had over 900 respondents. One, one of the things that stood out to me in the trailer was that uh, one of the reasons you wanted to do the project was to fill in the gaps left by media, film and television about Black Love. Can you talk a little bit more about that? Yeah. Uh, um, hi again, everyone. Um, it was co-founded by myself and Patsy Isles over food which shouldn't surprise most people. Um, and, you know, we're both former journalists and we were just so aware of how many questions we couldn't answer because of our absence, a uh, particular absence in terms of stats around lifestyle, whether or not we were getting married, what type of relationships we were having and so on. And yet we're overrepresented in the stats in relation to the criminal justice system, the mental health system, where we're overrepresented in terms of stop and search. Um, and that imbalance concerned me and concerned Patsy. And I think um, Patsy, as a, and also, you know, our differences, I mean, I'm single, I have no children. Mm. She was married and she has a daughter. And yet, and we're having these conversations and it's, there is this sort of idea that we don't talk our business. Mm. 
Mm. Um, and a lot of the time, you know, the whole thing about, you know, you don't hear your dirty linen in, in public. So, but we didn't buy into that. Mm -hmm. And so it felt really important that there was some sort of, even in, from Patsy's perspective as a parent, some sort of time capsule for mm -hmm. the next generation. Mm -hmm. So they knew that we existed and what we thought and felt and how we loved. So um, that, yeah, I mean, those are just some mm -hmm. of the, the reasons why we decided to independently, to, yeah. you know, it's like we thought about it, we thought, Okay, let, let, let's try this. So, so we, we established the Black Love Project in 2013, but we launched the survey in 2014, and that went through a particular journey. Yeah. We were just happy to get, if we got 250, 250 people, we would have been happy. And we noticed, okay, we hit that target, we pushed mm -hmm. it, and that's why it's, you know, we gradually spread the word and, and kept it open. Mm -hmm. um, but we did do other, other, quite a lot of work around it because that doesn't suit everyone to communicate mm. that way. Um, so we did focus groups. We did seven um, mm. in different parts of the country covering um, young people, 18 to 25, uh, black women, 55 plus, for example, um, LGBTQ plus mm. uh, communities, black, you know, gay men, um, lesbian and queer uh, people. Mm. And... So, and the Black Men's Group that was co-run with Black Men. So some of the groups were run by the constituency. Yeah. So the Young Persons mm -hmm. Group was run by a young person. And, you know, we've never made the findings from those this public. We, we will disseminate some of that. Mm -hmm. um, invaluable. And one yeah. thing that struck us more than anything else is it's interesting. As soon as you set up a conscious, safe, Black-led space, how willing that the allegedly unwilling are to speak mm, mm. that's interesting so um talking a little bit about the findings then um what were some of the biggest findings that you found from this first iteration because obviously this um event is is um a precursor to your relaunch of the Black Love Project, but it'd be interesting to see what kind of your biggest findings were from your first iteration. Well, it's funny because I have to re-familiarise myself because it's <laughs> like, we did a whole podcast series, by the way, on the mm. findings, which is fascinating. Mm -hmm. um, and I just want to think, it's really important to, to mention, again, just referring back to Patsy's point about a time, you know, capsule of who we are, for, you know, for future generations. When we think about what's happened to that young black girl in Ashford in Kent, mm -hmm. um, you know, and being attacked in the way she was in child Q, it, you know, this whole idea of these unloved black children mm -hmm. in the public space, you know, um, I think it's, this is why a project like this for me is so important. And, and we're not reflecting the, the, we're reflecting the British experience, not the American experience. That yes. was another very important um, reason for us. So in terms of um, some of the findings, so um, what we did in 2017, we launched a preliminary findings. And one thing we noticed is that we had obviously less men filling out the survey than women. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think most uh, researchers, marketeers will tell you that men are less likely to fill out surveys. Women are more likely to fill out surveys, mm -hmm. for example, um, and, and particular groups around access issues. So um, I think by the time we did the preliminary findings in 2017, we had about 500 plus who filled it out, 550. Right. We had about 16% were men. Mm. Um, by the time we, we closed the survey, uh, it was nearly 22%. So we're really okay. pleased about that. Mm. Um, so now, and also in terms of what's good, we had like so 90 Nearly one one percent identified as heterosexual, two point four percent gay, one point seven percent lesbian, four point three percent bisexual, and less than one percent identified as pansexual or queer. I think mm -hmm. that's because that was really important to us. Um, that the sort of heteronormative um, perspective about relationships and also about our different, you know, diverse experiences were, yeah. were reflected. And we had a really good age spread from 18 mm. to 60 plus. Okay. And so what, what I think is interesting, um, there's a couple of things, and I'll, I'll sort of say some of the percentages, but I just want to give such an overview really, I think yeah, it's gonna be useful. Be um, what was interesting is that um, how much we left 
space, you know, like, you, you know, you respond to the tick box mm -hmm. and then anything else you want to say. Mm -hmm. Wow. Just allowing <laughs> that space for the experiential side to come through was mm -hmm. just so, and is so rich. Yeah. Um, and so the things around um, relationships and about parenting, I think some of the strongest messaging came out around parenting, what your parents um, told you about sex and love um, and relationships, what you wish your parents told you more about. One of the things that um, all the respondents, you know, the majority of the respondents uh, said was that they wish their parents told them more about was relationships over 60%. Oh. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that's more so than sex. Sex was quite far down. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I think close, not well, significantly behind, but the next uh, topic was dating. So right. I think, and that sort of then mirrored itself, what that absence, how that's played out in people's dating lives, that the about over 60%, I'll give some specific when I roll down, but a significant number, the overwhelming majority who filled in the survey were single at the time of completing the survey. Mm -hmm. So when you think about the fact that, the, you know, what we want to know more about was, we wish our parents told us more about was relationships. Mm -hmm. And then how many weren't in relationship at the point of filling the survey was, I think, pretty mm -hmm. um, significant. The idea about the absent father, mm -hmm. you know, um, in terms of the tropes and, and um, black people, 56% mm -hmm. uh, had access to their parents for the whole duration of their life at the point of filling in um, the survey. Mm -hmm. um, but 37%, only 37% felt they could share their thoughts to their parents, and share their feelings things like relationships and so on and that was quite a consistent theme again around just around the communication mm -hmm. um you know they felt loved by by their parents particularly their mothers yeah. you know they felt the love from their mothers higher percentage again in the 60 percent range mm -hmm. compared to their father's 35 percent range mm -hmm. um and dating mm -hmm. the majority i think so i surprised people uh for my generation i'm 57 um the majority 66 percent largely met their dating prospects or their partners through um friends mm. and then 49 percent you know club or a bar and about 30 percent online mm. so um so they it was it's, you know they had more than one option so some yeah. so basically the most common way has interestingly has been through friends not online mm. and we know that there's a whole narrative around the hierarchical um uh experience for uh, black men and women, particularly black women, who are On seen as uh, yeah. in terms of dating websites. Mm. Yeah, exactly. So a lot mm. of them, especially at the time, we've got to remember this was done nine years ago, and so much has happened in that time. Mm. Um, in terms of whether or not you chose your um, dating prospects or relationship prospects um, on their ethnicity, fifty-one percent yes said they did, mm. and um, forty-nine percent said they didn't. So it's quite balanced and also we've got to remember that um the majority who filled in the survey were black women and, and mixed race women who um of black heritage and who identify um as black mm -hmm. um and 39 percent never dated outside of their race mm -hmm. as well um another sort of overview what i noticed though is because what what as we wanted to do was to ensure that you know, the whole thing is that you have to answer this question before you move on to the next question. I did not want, I wanted there to be a flow and, you know, Pax right. and I were on the same page with that. Mm -hmm. And also to see what questions people chose to respond to and chose not to. And so most, majority of the questions, the majority answered. Mm -hmm. Where there was a, a, a deviation was when it came to sex. Mm -hmm. And again, just how we're presented in the world mm -hmm. as these hypersexualized beings. Um, and yet that was the question that I would say we had, we saw about 20 to 30% drop off rate, about 30% mm. drop off rate in responses to questions, mm. either how much your parents discussed or talked, informed you around sex, um, or your experience of it from one night stands and so on. And I think that that, and again, bearing in mind that the majority who filled out the survey identified as, um, female. Yeah. I think there's more to be mined, which was backed up when we did the live event, because what we did in 2017 at 
Bush Theatre, we did the preliminary findings. We were oversubscribed. We, we, you know, we had to sort of turn people away and people came from outside of London to be together. And we talked about everything, including faith. Mm. And one, well, I never forget one person who came from Birmingham, who said right near the end when we were doing the preliminary findings, having the discussion, some of which was addressed in the um, trailer, mm. was that actually she feels that the first person first man in the house who was truly loved by mm. her mother was Jesus yeah because a picture of Jesus hanging across the <laughs> above the, the dining room and I think that some people could relate to that yeah and I think also um what you're saying when you showed shared some of the results with me what you're talking about the link between parenting and actually the black community generally is quite socially quite conservative and how that links yes. in with um religion and kind of leaves this sort of gap about how do people learn those relationship skills where do they do all of that were there any anything that surprised you about the links between those things well i think that how can i put it i think that doing the focus groups mm. um and I think that's why we definitely want to have more black men filling out the mm. survey and I think that that will happen you know mm. and and older people as well like 70 plus because we have mm. an aging population mm. um because when we did the focus group with the black men's focus group co-hosted by Lee Townsend mm. in Croydon um, that was something that, and it was intergenerational. So the youngest in the group was like 20 and then the oldest was, I think, 50s. Mm. And there's a point where we just watched the, the, the dynamic between all of them. They were mm. mentoring each other, supporting each other. And they were so honest and candid mm. and so emotionally present. And I just felt all of us, you know, myself and me felt this is what needs to be more in the public space yeah. because it was very surprising because what was the common link with the focus groups and another finding I think which is very significant is that 72% um, said they never saw their parents being affectionate with each other that mm -hmm. is high yes it is yeah about the our comfort zones even within the home mm -hmm. um, and how important because when we did the live event how much the parent side took up the conversation mm. that surprised me the most mm. how much parenting mm. being parented the dynamics between uh you know one parent and the other mm. um and the the impact i think what what this the space for is to discuss how has that impacted you in your life yeah, because I, mean, I think, yeah. yeah. Yeah, because I think um, that was one of the big things that came out of looking at some of the information in the survey was the huge role that parents um, made. But um, I'd like to go back to the point where you mentioned about the difference between uh, what you found in the results of the survey, survey and compared that to the depiction of black love in popular culture. You, me you mentioned about people's personal experience versus the hypersexualized uh, stereotypes. Um, is there anything else that you can illuminate for us on that point? Well, I think that, um what's interesting is about what struck me in terms of the more experiential stuff that came through mm. is how many of us are single mm. and have not experienced deep intimacy necessarily mm. and when you think about the role modeling it's mainly it is american mm. and then the whole thing now about and what's sort of really transpired over since especially since george floyd's murder mm. is around adverts yeah. and uh and the sea of interracial relationships primarily mm -hmm. with a black man and a white woman mm -hmm. and then very few with black women um and white men and black families you did not see very yeah. often at all until Sainsbury's when you think about it not the recent Christmas but the previous yes. Christmas did the black family and then there was a, the a, a black backlash and mm -hmm. then um all the supermarkets banded together and now you'll see more black families um mm. you know in terms of the very colorism i think that's mm. and but it's it's very rare to see the black woman centered 
as mm. the object of desire or yeah. appreciation or affection or, or mm. adoration. And, um, and that's still a struggle because mm. the primary purchaser and who are targeted by marketeers for decades, for centuries, you know, since advertising came into being, mm. are women and predominantly white women. Yeah. Um, and mm. so the last thing you're going to want to do is upset that apple cart about the hierarchy of beauty and who is seen as desirable and who's going to be positioned mm. as such um, mm. in the public space. So um, those are some of the things that you're seeing, you know, that, yeah, there is a shift and but there's still an underlying narrative mm. that is propping up a lot of the old tropes and uh, racist stereotypes and beliefs that have been in existence exactly for, 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 for forever, really. yeah and I mean when you look at the results from the survey it's quite even in terms of um, the numbers of black people that are in interracial relationships so to one of the questions um, it said that 40 percent of respondents had never dated outside of their relationships, 40% occasionally, and only 16% often or um, and 5% always. But you wouldn't think that by looking at adverts, you know, it's very rare to see um, a black couple together in adverts. It's starting to be a bit of a shift now. But what do you think the impetus is behind this? You've talked a little bit, little bit about um, maintaining the social hierarchy, but why is it that um, you often see um, black love only in terms of interracial relationships on television, do you think? Well, I don't, it's funny because I think there is a, I, like I said to you, uh, you know, before when we were prepping for the, 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 this yeah. uh, event, I think that, you know, in, in terms of the, um, census ons and other surveys one of the consistent figures is that um in terms of interracial relationships mm -hmm. um it is predominantly black men with white women i mean the, the, the stats bear that out um you know more than the other way around for example black women because we're talking about black love here so black women with white men necessarily but again that's why i think it's important for us to do the survey again mm -hmm. because things have shifted yeah um i think there's been a lot of discussion around wanting to experience love. Um, and as, as the survey shown that people are exercising their right to go out with who they want to go out with. And they're, mm -hmm. you know, so you've got a half who say, look, they, they, you know, they prefer to date someone from their own uh, ethnic background, which is what some, one of the, the, um, the poet uh, Tolu Agbalusi was saying in, in the um, trailer you know, mm. that that's a personal preference, which is what we're entitled to exercise. Mm. My issue is when what is elevated over what, yes. you know, and there is there is a hierarchical lens around which relationship is seen as more attractive, more desirable and more mm. palatable. And um, black women is at the, you know, they're at the bottom of the pecking order. And I mean, that's been much more widely discussed than pre-COVID. There's no question about yeah. that. There's numerous articles about that, you know, um, mm -hmm. So I think, and what, what is really important for us, you know, Patsy and I, when we're putting the, the survey together, that we include, because I know in the American project, which we launched after we launched ours, I'm not making any, that's not that's an observation, not yeah. saying, how mm. dare they? We, you know, that, that's <laughs> good because it's showing that there, there is a, there is a, there is a, a trend conversation we need to be had, yeah. And conversations and the black experience is not a singular thing. There's black experiences. Um, so for us, it felt really important that, you know, there's no question, if you are mixed race, mm -hmm. however you define that, you are going to be seen as black. Mm. You know, look at Meghan Markle. Yes. Enough said, do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. and, 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 and many people say, you know, when you think about Ruth Negro, who was in that amazing film about passing, yes. you know, and yet yeah, it's very, very clear especially when she got married in the church, she has a black mother, she is mm. a black, she's seen as a black woman mm. and she, you know, and that is part of her narrative. So mm. for us, it felt incredibly important to make sure that option was there, you know, mm. that we are looking at um, uh, mixed race experience as part of the black experience as well. So that felt really important to us. Mm -hmm. um, and, and those who are from those backgrounds, many spot and see what happens. So I think there is a sense it's a bit cynical. It's about what's palatable. Mm -hmm. um, 
you know, um, yes, there's stats to drive that, um, but I think that there is always a resistance when it comes to particular segments within the black community and black yeah. women is is the one who who experiences that here and in America mm. and in other you know other countries mm. where we're we're not the global majority. Mm. I mean one thing that interests me about it is what the impact is of these sort of depictions of black relationships because it seems as if what we see in the media doesn't really reflect our, ex our um, experience that's what's shown in your uh, survey there's either um, a this whole kind of religious or you know non-sexual uh, side or the hypersexual side can you say a bit more about looking more at the black community what kind of impact do you think those kind of um, depictions have on the way that we have love relationships did anything come through in your research at this more in terms of the focus groups I think mm -hmm. that there is you know even the fact that we've done what we've done if you th think about it answering questions put our lives at risk mm -hmm. we come from a legacy where exposure is risky mm -hmm. answering questions is risky which is why we have such a strong oral tradition mm -hmm. which is why the focus groups were so impactful and i think we were and why having even a blank canvas a space saying tell us what you think what is your experience mm -hmm. and so we you know we this is like a container for that because a lot of the time you are not in spaces where you can have these conversations because often more than not if you have a particular type of career you're in spaces where you're in the minority mm. and the lens you have to fight through the lens of how you're seen you know and, and you may not feel safe to have that conversation yeah. about yourself you know because of how easy it is for people to misunderstand and also the starting point isn't anywhere near where you live Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know and knowing that your lived experience and how that's manifest and a common thing is around your mental health and well-being yeah. that's where the stats we need to follow the trail and when you look at um you know four times more likely to be sectioned to be detained all these type of things the fact that the stats around our mental health uh, as uh, ill health as black women has mm -hmm. steadily been increasing mm -hmm. um stats have suggested you know there's been an increasing number to self-harm which Maureen Cole, the fantastic you know, journalist and presenter, mm -hmm. did her a piece and she won the Mind uh, Media Award for that mm -hmm. piece on BBC Radio 4. Mm -hmm. There's you, these things come, but there's no discussion. Mm -hmm. You know, there's no space for us to have those discussions. And, and so this, the information's there, some of the stats are there, but it's about, you know, my former profession, the cherry picking mm -hmm. of what is, what is, you know, presented and what isn't. Yeah. Same thing with, um, you know, yeah, and in publishing as well, if you look at now, we seem to see a lot, you know, Bernadine Evaristo winning, you know, um, the, the um, Booker Prize uh, in 2019. Uh, we're having a lot more Black poets winning the prestigious prizes. So there is, there is a shift through hard work that, that's happening, mm -hmm. but, you know, we're still hearing stories from those who are writing things for TV and so on, and can you make that, even now, a black character being asked, can you make that character white? And mm. do black people eat spaghetti bolognese? Courtney Newland, who is a brilliant, you know, uh, yes. playwright and novelist, <laughs> you know, has spoken about that, mm. you know? So, so where is that? So those things are still lingering around, mm. often unchallenged. Yes. You know, so, yeah. Yeah, I mean, thinking a little bit about broadening the scope of what a, a black relationship um, means, um, you mentioned earlier the uh, focus groups. One of the areas that doesn't get a lot of um, highlighting are the LBG, LGBTQ plus experience. And I know that you had a focus group on that. But, oh, we had a couple, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. what kind of um, findings came out of that group? Well, I mean, from memory, I mean, a big shout out to Rain Chloe and the team at Rainbow Noir in um, Manchester. And we also had um, Hackney CVS and some other groups um, in Hackney and so on, black men, gay men's groups, and also um, Robert Berkeley mm. as well, who all talked in relation to um, being hidden. Mm. And also, let's me make a distinction as well. So, you know, an African experience, the Caribbean experience, like British experience. Mm. Um, and what some of the things was around just having the spaces 
safe spaces to be and have the conversation. Mm -hmm. um, the fact that, you know, the other side of the coin, like, you know, some of uh, the, the queer women who were supported by their parents or by their fathers, yeah. for example, those stories not coming out, yes. relationships that are long standing mm. that haven't come out, mm. the fact that there is a deep love with love affair with love. I remember one D saying, I'm, I'm deeply in love with love. I love being in love. And so a lot of the time, it's just actually sitting in here and experiencing and understanding the relationships. The fact that they're having relationships for a start, the yeah. fact that, that they want, you know, the romance is happening and they want romance, mm -hmm. but also the fact that there is persecution often within different black communities um, and how out are and can you be? And also intergenerationally, because we had some, um, uh, those who are part of the, the focus groups coming from like Liverpool, right. you know, and never ever been in a space like that to be able to talk openly. One was in her 60s mm -hmm. and it was just a masterclass in history. Yeah. Um, so I think that, so it's not as divergent as you think yeah. from some of the heteronormative experiences, mm -hmm. you know, that, that sort of distance with parents, but also situations where there's a real camaraderie or understanding with mm -hmm. the parent. Um, yeah, and, sorry. No, go ahead. No, and I was going to say also contrast a little bit with this idea of not speaking about your business, but actually these uh, re different relationships and different definitions of black love are happening in the community and we're not generally seeing these or giving space uh, for people to discuss them. So, um, We've talked before about how in the focus groups you felt that people uh, felt that they were in a much safer space and able to perhaps talk about things that, you know, you can't really fit into a questionnaire. So thinking about the relaunch, um, is that the sort of um, attack that you're going to be taking with this new iteration of the Black Love uh, project? Well... <clears throat> All right, before I answer that, one more thing I wanted to say in relation mm. to um, the LGBTQ plus um, mm. focus groups that we hosted. Um, the common theme, and I'm, again, across all the groups, all the focus groups, representation, the lack of representation, mm. representation in books. You know, um, now we've got podcasts. So that's if you look at the proliferation of podcasts, look at where we're popping up now. You know, mm. it's, 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 it's in those sort of spaces where you've got that independence. Mm. Um, but that was, that was a common theme and frustration, actually. Um, so in terms of the, the, the next iteration, um, the survey, we're going to continue. We've done IG Lies, we've done the podcast, like I said. Mm. We are in talks with the award-winning theatre to do a takeover on an ongoing basis where we actually have live events. Mm. So live podcasts, we have a Black Love Night, we have talks, we have a dating... Uh, quiz but it, across the spectrum yeah. um, we also want to um, broaden the focus on different types of love in terms of um, self-care mm -hmm. because you know because we are walking into spaces that are colonially printed mm -hmm. and where as soon as we walk in people presume to know who we are assume who we are yeah and then you you haven't even opened your mouth mm -hmm. and so that needs tending to that needs love and attention and that's self-investment so yeah. there is um you know we've been developing uh models of creative well-being for example yeah. and you know and this ties into where's the colors broader mission which is that we need these untold stories to be heard mm -hmm. but they need to be spoken first yeah. so a lot of what we got from the first um iteration I mean, like I said, led to so many podcasts that were really well received. Initially on SoundCloud, we were migrating them to um, uh, Anchor and Spotify now, but we're going to keep both going. And so I think there is also more of a willingness because what struck us during COVID, yes. uh, there was uh, on initially in February on uh, 2021, all of a sudden our analytics spiked we have a specific page for the Black Love Project. Yeah. It's, it's just, it's static more or less, you know. Mm. Um, there we had like 385 people in the space of a couple of hours who who went to that site. Yeah. And that that spoke volumes to us. Yeah. And you know, constantly we're seeing hits because we are seeking out 
answers. We seek in that space to hear and be mirrored back to. Exactly. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah because especially there is, after COVID. Yeah, yeah, because there is that kind of desire for community and visibility and seeing each other's stories. So um, you've mentioned that, um, that the relaunch is going to be at the end of March. Is that going to also include a new survey? Yes. Yes, okay. so we'll announce it. We'll announce that because it's also part of the survey. We're asking people. I think what's really important now because we really, really try for it not to be an extractive process. Right. You know, because we go through enough emotional labour in our lives. Mm. You know, unpaid. Um, but it's more in relation to what do you want? What area of your life needs more love and needs more attention? And obviously, because we are involved in the the business of stories and writing. Mm -hmm. um and we produce and that's the other part as well that we want to um we're, we're toying with the anthology mm -hmm. um and we're also looking for ways to actually get these things into a space like through film tv and so mm -hmm. on mm -hmm. so we're, we're now it's now merging into words of colors uh broad emission which is what we do mm -hmm. um but i don't want to presume anything which is why mm -hmm. i think it's important now because so much has happened you know um People are now openly talking about colorism and black fishing, for example. Yeah. You know, we've we've had, you know, like I mentioned about what happened in Ashford Kent with this young black girl. Um, and uh, also, you know, Tyree Nichols, you know, the Windrush yeah. scandal that's still going on, Grenfell. There's so much stuff that's happened that's mm -hmm. I think led us to be even more visible with our thoughts and experiences and outrage about all of these things. Yeah. So I think it's, yeah, I think it's, it's a very prime time to do this again. Okay. Uh, can you say again um, the name of the podcast and where people can go to find information about the, uh, the new launch of the Black Love Project? Right. So Words of Colour is wordsofcolour.co.uk. Mm -hmm. um, there's the Black Love Project.co.uk. On <laughs> Twitter, we're... Uh, Black Love, Black Love UK. So Black Love UK on Twitter and on Instagram with we are the Black Love Project. Okay. So um, yeah, yeah. And the podcast is Black Love Bites, but that's going to be relaunched uh, in the late spring. Yeah. But you can find that again. If you come to our website, you can find or go to the Black Love uh, Dot your code at uk you can find out about the podcast okay and all of these links by the way for the audience they are all available uh in the event bright information that we had for this so the questions have been uh pouring in uh throughout this discussion so um i'm going to scroll back to the top um and we'll try and fit in as many as we can so uh the first question is um how do you think we can engage more black men in deeper conversations around black love good question um and that's what we're looking to do um and we've done work with black men since the um uh survey and what we find is actually doing them in public i don't i, I mean we did something uh with Derek Owusu, mm -hmm. uh, safe about black men and masculinity. We had uh, four to five books from the, the books, like Nels Abbey, Kutia Newland, uh, uh, Derek Owusu. Mm -hmm. And we were very, very clear, this was at Kiln Theatre, that we wanted black men, because usually black women turn up or women. Mm -hmm. And we had such an amazing turnout from black men. Mm -hmm. So I think black men need to be involved in the project. And I think black men being visible you know, if I'm willing to be public and speak, black men will come. And like when in time we've done events with black men, like so we did something with, um, oh gosh, you know, like with a black footballer, for example, mm -hmm. you know, we get black men. So if black men are positioned to be talking mm -hmm. in a space that's held well, and we're good at holding space, yeah, mm -hmm. um, black men come. So I think that it, we, and I think you can't just do surveys. You have to uh, make that true diversity in terms of the, the method and the tactics mm. to have the conversation. So one-on-ones, audio, mm. um, and and face-to-face. -face. Have you found that face-to-face -face has gone down really well, which may surprise yeah. people, but yeah, mm. it has. Yeah, because I think, um... 
also about how you facilitate those conversations within a community as well um, is really important. So about providing those spaces. Sometimes there can be a tendency to leave the emotional work and the emotional labour to uh, the female uh, or female identifying part of the population. But actually having those spaces might be a way um, for men to engage more in those conversations. Does that ring true? Another you? thing I want to add, Yes, because also what's happened as well, I've got to acknowledge um, and draw attention to the work that's been done by that's in the Black Barbers Network. Yeah. So during COVID, the Black, bar, black Barbers and, and those who were allies, let's be really clear, so it's not just Black Barbers, those who are allies too, that barber chair has been a space for amazing conversations um, mm. and has facilitated uh, Black men's well-being, especially during COVID, covid and the lockdowns and before mm. and there's been a much stronger and higher take-up rate mm. uh so that's another thing just like hairdressers for us you know but and, yeah. and, and barbers i used to go to barbers too you mm. know um so that's another so like you say there's so much options and avenues in the community and that's one of them yes so another question is um what your thoughts are on interracial relationships not being inherently progressive? I'm not sure that we said that, but do you have any thoughts on that? So again, it's not bad. really because I'm I can't comment. Yeah. Mm. If from what perspective? Because it's not inherently progressive. I'm, I'm I don't understand because obviously, if someone chooses to be, and I know friends and so on, and colleagues who are in and on all across the intersectional spectrum, queer, otherwise who are interracial relationships. Um, and, and some of them are the most progressive activists I know, <laughs> um, the black partners in, you know, in, in those relationships. So, and I think, I think also there's an expectation of the opposite, but I, I think that if anything, the things that you have to process to be in that relationship, you know, if you are a conscious person, you have to go through that and have those yeah. conversations with yourself, hopefully with your partner, yes. um, with your friends and everything else, if it's an issue. And so you go in the world, you then not only have the, the black experience, but the fact that you're interracial relationship and everyone who's got an opinion on it. Um, mm. So I, I don't see it as inherently problematic. I think the problem is, um, you know, how it's positioned. Mm. um and you know that that that's it and 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 you know and also just like you know everyone goes into relationships for different reasons yeah and I think that when you think about the, the politics and those who have been killed because they were in an interracial relationship this is that's no minor thing but the, mm. the white partner or the black partner or, or you know you've got the till film out now yeah. It is, you know, they, we can't conflate Jim Crow and what, what was done, you know, and how that was positioned and the elevation of the white woman mm -hmm. at the expense of black people in our lives mm -hmm. with two people choosing to be together and attracted to each other who love each other. Mm -hmm. um, and then you're going to have the additional uh, negative attention on you yeah. in that space. Mm -hmm. So, and that's why for me, we need to hear from those who are, that's their lived experience rather than presuming, yeah. you know? Yeah. Mm. And I think part of the issue is also the representation of it or lack of representation when um, black people being in- That's love, where, only, that's, that's what needs our attention. As, yeah, are only ever depicted as being in interracial relationships, whereas there's a, a wide, wide variety. So there's a, a gap between people's lived experience and then how people's, um, how these relationships are, dictate, are depicted in uh, general media. Yeah, but um, also we're used, you know, they, that, that, that coupling is used. Mm. And you think about the rooms in which these, these you know, th those presentations are unveiled. Yes. Yeah. W what's the thinking? So to me, th there is nothing necessarily inherently problematic mm. with being an interracial relationship. What is problematic is acting as if we are post-racial. Mm. Or positioning, like, you know, we don't need to talk about racism or anything now because, look, this is, this is, yeah. this is what's going on. Yeah things exist and coexist in spite of yes yeah um so look 
this one is about um, how the asexual uh, stereotype also is almost like the other side of the coin of the hypersexual um, stereotype. So Mammy versus Jezebel, for instance. Did you find, do you have much to say about that? Because I mean, that kind of links in with what some of the findings of the report that many of the women are either single or you know that kind of conservative um bent but and how this varies is so much our opposition of the way that black people might be presented in the media of these hypersexualized creatures so it's almost as if they're two sides of the same coin we are nuanced yeah we are celibate we are we are sexually active we are in relationship, we are monogamous, we are polyamorous. And the thing is, we're doing all this stuff. I mean, fair enough, you know, I don't, I mean, I'm very private, you know what I mean? At the same time, I will speak about my experience, you know, and again, about having the choice about when, and that's the thing for me about creating the spaces where there is agency mm. and there is choice, there is reflection, there is respect, um, there is collaboration, mm. you know what I mean? there is a sense that you are held there yeah. is a spiritual context as well you know because that's another thing because everything is banded under the heading of faith you know I, i'm spiritual yes you know at the same time and and you know and so we're our representation is so behind yes it's so you know, it is so behind mm. when i look at but when i that's why i became a journalist you know uh, 30 plus years ago Mm. You know, my first, you know, life and things were not, I was livid, you know, mm. about the lack of our representation, the amount of things I had to challenge at that point in my mm. career and realise we are so not known. I mean, mm. sometimes we don't, what, there, there is a sense of protectionism that existed mm. for a long time. Mm. No blacks, no dogs, no Irish. Come on. You know, that's a recent, you know, legacy. Mm. Um, and whereas now, if you're noticing, uh, we're, we're much more present on certain social media platforms. We have Black Twitter because it's mm. about controlling our narrative and narratives. And mm. so there is so much catching up to do. That's putting yeah. it mildly. We are mm. many things. And Michaela Cole has been really important in, in cutting through, um, you know, with chewing gum. Yes. You know, and I made these stories made really story important. Mm -hmm. And also what she's had to say publicly, you can't, you know, it's, and then she has to sort of take a break because, mm -hmm. you, you know, we're not in a position, we're going to have a black queer Doctor Who. Do you mm -hmm. know I mean? We, you know, all these, so there's, there's, let's look at, there's some major things going on here. And we know that is those decisions, when you're going to take up those roles or write those things, we're not just writing and say, here you go, huge emotional strain no, and stress that, yeah. putting that into the world no, mm -hmm. and, and stress and anticipation and mental stress putting that into the world yeah. because you have you know we're part of a scare, um, scapegoated global community mm -hmm. no matter which country you go to mm -hmm. it, they have a trope around black people yes you know you can go somewhere you know and no matter what that is one thing where there's a shared narrative there is a single narrative about who we, we are Mm. All right. And so um, for me, the focus and work needs to be on different ways of getting our stories, you know, facilitating um, different people to tell their stories, write their stories, fiction, nonfiction, mm. you know, think about TV, the amount of emails we get about how do I become a, you know, working TV, the amount who of black people who are in professional careers but what, deeply want to be a creative be in fashion yeah. expressed through that way which mm. has always been at the heart of our lives who does not know someone who sews mm. who who um sings mm. who um all untrained you mm. know amazing cook and baker all these things so the idea is really that we contain multitudes you know so much so much broader than um, any of the stereotypes there are multitudes that are not being documented and uh, on to a, a more pragmatic question um how and where do you go to meet a decent black man is one <laughs> did you get any insights about that in the, in the results <laughs> that that will definitely be phase two yeah. So thank you. And, and look out. So, um, yeah, so literally come to go to Words of Colour mm -hmm. um, and follow us on Words of Colour, Words of Colour on every platform. Mm -hmm. All right. And let us know because and, and 
because we will <laughs> that's why we're going to have live events mm-hmm. and um and we will be I'm not going to announce now but that's something because that was a huge part of the survey mm-hmm. it was it was relationships it was love it was dating okay mm-hmm. they're all different things mm-hmm. and about our, uh, our not just romantic relationships our familial relationships our, our friendship really as you know so we've done series since like we've done uh, a, a virtual series on um uh you know uh sisterhood queerhood brotherhood mm-hmm. motherhood fatherhood singlehood for example yeah. for the love of food so the dating part that's going to be a running yeah. story so just watch this space <laughs> watch that this is definitely space. on the agenda yeah okay yeah. great so do you have any favorite films or books or media that you've come across that do portray black love in a positive way as we've talked about some of the more problematic portrayals anything that comes to mind that you've liked recently i i would say jacaranda mm-hmm. cassava press mm-hmm. anchor press and cara press there's some amazing independent publishers yeah. who are and, and there's someone called ola awanubi who writes great romantic black fiction um so there are a lot of and, and um lisa bent who wrote simona is still single actually the person who asked that question about dating and needs to be simona is still single uh, which you can get from jacaranda uh books which, uh, which is a great book um bad romance uh by Marmay Blue is another great book. Mm-hmm. So there are, um, so that's just one example, just in terms of um, uh, what's been going out there in terms of, there is so much to be said mm-hmm. for literature. Um, so that's, yeah, that's, that's just one example really. And in terms of um, TV, I think there's still some catching, catching up to do yeah. really in terms of TP that's, I mean, so there's, you know, explosion in terms of Nollywood, and Bollywood, you've got riches on ITV. I'm in shock because ITV has been so late for the, to the party, and oh, I've got yes, a lot that of respect. One on ITVX. ITVX, yes, yeah. and I, I love Sarah Niles, so I, I want to just show support for a Black British yeah. um, helmed series. Mm. But we need that's the part with I think there's still the resistance. We need yeah. um, way more. You know, there's there's stuff going on with CBBC um, mm. in terms of uh, children's programming. Um, but I think that uh, there's a lot of stuff around ch- publishing and also roundtable books and so on. And also the knock-on effect and Own It London is another one who, who do things, not just books, um, but they, they were working like with Netflix and so on to get some of them right. commissioned mm-hmm. uh, as films and so on. Um, mm-hmm. Courtier Newland and, um, for example, Alex Wheater have some things in development. Mm-hmm. Theatre, Theatre Peckham. Kiln Theatre, there's some amazing, The Wives of Wilsden, uh, Wife of Wilsden, which is finishing and then it's going to tour in America. So I'd say theatre, there's a lot of amazing stuff going on. Um, uh, Bush Theatre, oh my God, um, some amazing, amazing stuff that's, that's gone on that tackles a whole spectrum of our experiences. Um, there is something going on at Contact Theatre, which is highlighting um, the Black British tran- trans experience currently. So I'd say check those things out for example mm. yeah so theatre um and in terms of book I think film and we know tv a lot more work to be done yeah. um so uh, the question has been um where the results are published that uh, people would love to see and read them all right so what we're going to do because obviously we have to respect people's confidentiality so mm. for example what Julie's been sent is just the statistics um in terms of the overall findings but not the experiential information so mm. what we're going to do um Tamira uh Heron who's part of our team has started you saw some of them in the um the trailer you didn't hear them but you saw them in the trailer yeah. <laughs> so we're, we're, cre- we're creating infographics so there will be a narrative that we're going to create and also one based on the focus groups so we'll unveil those um as the year progresses okay. but by the time we relaunch some of the main findings will be available okay and that will yeah. they be available on your website yes they will the because black love project will have its own identity on our website okay. but also if you seek out black love bites and bites is like megabytes B-Y-T-E-S. so b-y-t-e-s mm-hmm. so if you look at look out for that on either soundcloud or on um 
Spotify, we talk about the survey um, with different people. Um, Derek Arusu, Steve Pope, who used to, who helped, you know, was senior on the, on the voice and co-founded Express. So we've got a range of people that we speak to. So mm. I'd, I'd recommend, yeah, in the interim, seek out our podcast. Okay, great. So um, this one is about the framing of black love. Is it essentializing to frame black love through the lens of a black racialized couple? Oh, mm. I don't know. Mm. I don't know. I think, um, no, I think the whole for me is with black love, it needs to be, we need to know what an 18 year old sees it as. Mm. Um, we need to see, know what a, 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 a 70 year old um, trans woman sees it as, has been in, in, in hiding all that time. Mm. You know, we need to see it through our grandparents or grandparent. <laughs> so I think that for me, I think we need to step away from that view of about black love, heteronormative couple, that's it. Mm. I think there's so many different, we need to out ourselves in a healthy, safe way. Mm. Um, you know, and what you've noticed, you know, I'd, I've noticed in terms of the whole discussion around our uh, fluidity, mm. um, you know, that's always been present. Mm. You know, we we know the conversations, it's always been present. Yeah, it's just so I think it's, yeah. Mm. No, no, but also there's not been a framing to say, oh, right, I recognise myself. Yes. That's that, that, ah, oh, mm. that explains Uncle mm. Johnny, or that explains me. Yes. You know, and, and I cannot, I, I used to be someone who thought, I, I, in my 20s, you know, you always have to write off your 20s with how, just how dogmatic <laughs> you are. Um, you know, about, I don't need role models, role models are, you know, not helpful. And I cannot, I'm like, child, you didn't know what you're talking about. Because yeah. now I'm like, so important, even at my time of life, mm. you know, it's so, and then when you realize that, you know, you play that role, but you're not owning the fact how important they are. And I think yeah. a lot of the time we haven't done that, but a lot of it is just being able to talk to each other without feeling we're going to be attacked. And yeah. I think that is too common in terms of our experience, because that's what we've been saddled with that way of communicating. Mm -hmm. and, and, and the internal oppressor and the level of anxiety we live with as black people that's just not being processed, Yeah, you know? Yeah. And there's a whole therapeutic arm to this that we, we, we are developing. It's, it's important, mm -hmm. you know, we need, we need to be soothed and healed while we're going out being who we are. Mm -hmm. Because I think that for me, the whole idea about black love is that being able to live our full authentic self, mm -hmm. but we are, contending with arrested development not out of choice yeah you know and so until we build and leave all these options and for you to know it's okay I'm not judging you explore it experiment mm. you know it doesn't have to be public but I think we need to be living it for ourselves mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean following on a little bit about um uh, the essentializing notion of um, black love just being about a black racialized couple. Um, and we've already kind of addressed this in a way when considering interracial relationships, if one party is not racially racialized as black, does this not qualify as black love? So the question is, you know, if one person in the relationship um, doesn't see themselves as black, is that still black love or not? Ah, good question. Well, I would say, um, no, are you, so, so, okay. How I'm hearing that question, just to make sure I'm hearing this correctly, mm -hmm. that you're talking about the interracial relationship where the person is in denial of their blackness. So you, so are you saying that, is it about the black partner, part of the partnership not identifying as black? Um, I mean, the way that- I just I'm, want to be clear. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm not sure if the person could perhaps uh, um, uh, qualify that a little bit, but I mean, the way that I'm understanding it is, you know, is black love just about black couples? If no, like I said, like I said yeah. earlier on, that's why yeah. we include, so no, I yeah. don't agree with that. I think, mm. I, th I think the way the world is set up, mm. and I'm as a black person, I go out with someone who's non-black mm. tomorrow, I'm dating. Mm. My lens is a black lens. 
Mm. My love is coming from me as a black woman. I don't all of a sudden, my blackness, my black card isn't revoked as far as I'm concerned or invalidated mm. because I've, I'm chosen to be with someone who's white yeah. or Asian or Eastern Europe. Do you see what I mean? I, yeah. I, 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 I am in the world. I'm not tied to the hip to that person, whoever mm. that person is. Mm. And when I go in the world and how I'm being met is I have my version of my blackness. Mm. And then I'm meeting other, pe other black people's version of my blackness. Yeah. And then I'm meeting other white people, other nationalities when I travel mm. for work or for pleasure, for notions mm. of my blackness. Mm. So as far as I'm concerned, mm. unless I am in denial of my blackness, that's what I thought the question was alluding to, yeah. then I would say no, you mm. know, that you are, hence why we make sure that is included. Yeah. So, so that mixed race child in a school who's being bullied because of the texture of their hair and the color of their skin, I mean, I'm pretty light skin, mm -hmm. you know, and I come from a Caribbean Jamaican background. And when you look at our history, yeah, we're mixed. Mm. Do you know what I mean? You know, um, so yeah, so I I from my perspective, when you walk out of that door, mm. you know, um, and me as a black woman, do you mean anyone I in terms of the people I know, mm. that is how I'm moving. It's it's an intrinsic part of who I am. Yeah. Mm. and how I'm going to relate and, and, and how, if I'm challenged, I will challenge, you know, it's not challenging. Where is, it, where, 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 where is my response coming from? When I love, it's coming from my black space. Mm. When, I, when I'm challenging you, it's coming from my black space Regardless. because I was born this way. I don't know yeah. any different, mm. Mm. you know? So that, that's my take on it. Yeah. I think this will be the part of one of the, get, getting to the last couple of questions. Uh, was there any inclu inclusion within the research around when black love hurts or harms? Interestingly, that that came out independently anyway, because mm. if you're, if, yeah, so the thing is, I think that, you know, again, making sure we didn't want to steer people mm. and having the space for, for um, their own expression, Mm. of their experience so what was in there was you know someone who a lesbian uh woman talking about her experience with her dad mm -hmm. in terms of coming out and how supportive he was and sort of stopping him from going clubbing with her mm. <laughs> you know <laughs> right right through to mm. um you know not having that experience mm. you know and so I think that Hurt seems to be a byword for, for being black, isn't it? Mm. And I think even that needs to be, you can't move beyond that without mm. exploring that mm. and then not being stuck in it and trying to understand that. Mm. It's not excusing it, mm. but understanding it. Because I yeah. think that a lot of the time we, we it was, it, it's, it's a blame and shame mm. just, just hovering around us. Mm. And so it's like we can't even share the fact that something not great happened mm. in terms of within our black experience, yeah. you know, and then straight away that then typifies us all, mm. you know, when, 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 when that's the reality in most relationships, whether, you know, look how many women, have, for example, just like, you know, just is one example, mm. you know, in terms of heterosexual, you know, heteronormative relationships, how many women are attacked and killed per week? Mm. And then how many, um, uh, for example, um, black trans men and women uh, are or queer, uh, who, yeah, uh, those who identify as queer, who are attacked within their own families. Yeah. I mean, those stats, stats are stats in Lambeth, you know, they're stats on sad, sadly, you know, so, but to me, that says love, love is absent. Mm. Mm. So I think we need to be really clear how we use that term, mm. you know, because that to me says there's an absence of love. Mm because how can you love someone I think sometimes again it's, 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 so that's why I think it's important for us to understand what does one thing we did we had a card saying what is your definition of black love mm -hmm. and it was so diverse some of it was just a feeling you know so I think again that's why this this is a to me this is a lifelong project that I hope others continue once because we it's independent it's unfunded mm -hmm. we've done it it's funded by us we've we, we've done this and held this ourselves for the last nine years it felt that important you know, um, and it is that important. Yeah. But I think it is around creating the spaces yeah. and, and our language. We've got our own language, but being confident in that language um, because we've seen how woke has been hijacked, you know, so in our language, but, but not for us not to be confused about what love is meant to feel and look like. Yeah. Mm. So um, 
just to summarise the last couple of um, questions, um, we will provide links at the end of this to uh, the name of the podcast, and you've mentioned a few times where people can find it. Um, it would be great if you could give us a list of those uh, publishers and some of the books that you mentioned, you know, when you, you were giving us examples of the positive um, representations. Uh, somebody's asked if we can have a, a list of those. But on that yeah. note, though, um, is the, on that note, Joy, um, this has really been a really um, fascinating and enlightening conversation. And I really like the turn that it's taking towards making spaces and creating community, really. So I just want to um, thank you so much for um, spending your time with us this evening and sharing the results of this project. Well, thank you for having me, Julia. You know, um, it's great to see the work that you're doing mm -hmm. as well after all those years uh, when we first connected um, mm -hmm. So and, and reconnecting. So, yeah, thank you. And to the team. Oh, you're very welcome. So um, that also brings us to the end of our uh, talk this evening. On behalf of the Black History Year Steering Group, I'd like to thank you all for coming tonight. A quick reminder that this event recording will be made available on our website and the link will be put into the chat. Um, the next Black History Year Steering Group event, we will be welcoming Maxine Edgar on the 19th of April to discuss grief in the Black community at 6pm. So please save the date. You can register your place via um, the link in the chat. Thank you all very much. And thank you again, Joy, for joining us. Yeah, go ahead. Thank you. Yeah, just one more thing I just want to say, because we had yeah. it in the promotional stuff, but I just want to give a big shout out to Adria McKenzie from AMC mm. Media, who mm. produces the podcasts and a lot of the uh, visuals and the films that we've done in the past. So she's been so important to this project. It takes a village to do this. And so I've, I've acknowledged some people, but I definitely want to acknowledge her. Great. Yeah. It's, yeah. None of us are doing these things on our own, are we? So thank you all very much and have a good evening. Bye everyone, take care. Bye.